Hello, and welcome to Lecture 3 of the Energy Fundamentals Unit in Phys 2104. In previous courses, you've probably looked at work in some detail. Now we're going to look at the other way that systems can exchange energy with their, with their environment, heat. So far, we've seen that if we put two objects in contact, thermal energy will transfer from the higher temperature object to the lower temperature one. This actually goes by the name of the zeroth law of thermodynamics, and I hope you find it as funny as I do that there is a zeroth law. The first law is more familiar, that's conservation of energy. When we put them together, we conclude then that when a system is in contact with a hotter part of the environment, then there will be a transfer of thermal energy into the system. And similarly, if the system is in contact with a cooler part of the environment, thermal energy will be transferred out. We're not only going to talk about transfer in and out of a system, though, we're also going to talk about transfer or transport through objects. One of the basic ideas we need is flux. When we take two objects at different temperatures and put them together, we already know that there's a transfer of thermal energy from one to the other. We often say that energy flows from the hot object to the cold one. We're using language as if energy is a fluid here. It isn't, but we'll often use language that suggests that it is. In any case, it will flow through the surface that joins the two objects. So if we take our system to be the cold object, then the amount of energy transferred is the heat, the thing we call Q in the equation of the first law of thermodynamics. We're often concerned with the rate of energy transfer. Now this has the units of power, watts, but it's such an important thing that we give it its own name. We call it heat flux. The idea of flux is very general and applies to a lot of different things. For example, we could talk about a marching band going down the road and, say, passing through one of those inflatable archways with some cross-sectional area A. Then the musician flux would be the density of musicians, musicians per meter squared, times their speed, times the area of the archway that they're marching through. And that's going to be in musicians per unit time. Similarly, we could talk about air circulation in a building and say the volume of air flowing through some doorway per unit time, which would turn out to just be the speed of the air times the area of the doorway. Notice that fluxes are always proportional to area we can see how to get an area proportionality in heat flux by thinking, say, about the musician flux for a moment. Notice that there's this first part of the relationship that only depends on variables that are describing behavior of the musicians, and then that's multiplied by the area that they're marching through. So it's often useful to condense all the parts that depend on the behavior of the musicians into a single variable that you would call the musician flux density, because it is a number of musicians per unit time per unit area. It's flux per unit area. We can do exactly the same thing with any flux, including heat flux. And so, if it goes through some area A, we can define a heat flux density, which is going to be in watts per meter squared. So far, we've been talking about a particular type of heat transfer called conduction, where objects are directly in contact with each other and the transfer happens through the materials. This is very important in applications like insulation of houses, where thermal energy is conducted from, say, the warm inside of the house to the colder outside. But another important mechanism of heat transfer is radiation, where, for example, you have something like the sun, which emits electromagnetic radiation, and that radiation carries thermal energy from the sun to other things such as the earth. Another much more complicated mechanism of heat transfer is convection, which you see all the time, such as in a boiling kettle. In general, you have some hot thing and some cold thing with a fluid in between. Thermal energy is transferred, which sets up a temperature gradient in the fluid, and because of density changes, that will get the fluid moving. Now, because you have hot fluid going one way and cooler fluid going the other, you'll have a net transfer of heat. Let's look in more detail at conduction. Suppose we have two objects, one hot and one cool. 
And let's say these temperatures are held fixed in some way, probably by contact with other large objects. And now we put some other object joining them. That object is going to have some cross-sectional area that we'll call A and some length L. And let's set some axes and think about what happens if initially this object is at a uniform temperature. What happens next to this bar connecting the hot object to the cold object is complicated. Too complicated for us, it involves solving differential equations. But in general terms, what happens is that thermal energy is going to come in at one end and leave at the other, and in general, the heat flux is going to depend on where in the rod you look. The temperature profile inside the rod is similarly going to start changing in a very complicated way. However, eventually it settles down to a very simple situation and then it stays like that. This is an example of something called a steady state. It's not at equilibrium because it's exchanging thermal energy with its environment, although the net rate of exchange is zero. And as a result, all the variables describing this rod will be constant, even though it's not in equilibrium. In this particular steady state, the temperature is a linear function of position, and the flux turns out to be constant as a function of position. And so it's the same everywhere, and it turns out to have a value which looks like this. Notice this part. That's just the slope of the temperature versus position graph. And more generally, even when it's not in steady state, the flux at any location involves the derivative of the temperature with, res with respect to position. This constant kappa is a material property of the rod called the thermal conductivity. Dividing through by the cross-sectional area of the rod, we get the flux density, which has a nice simple form. And this equation connecting the flux density with the thermal conductivity and the derivative of temperature with respect to position is called Fourier's law of heat conduction. Fourier's law has lots of implications and applications. For example, look at this frying pan and notice how where the handle joins the pan, the flux must all pass through a very small cross-sectional area of metal. And because it's passing through a small cross-sectional area, that tells us there will be a large flux density in that part of the handle, which means the rate of change of temperature with respect to position is large. In other words, the temperature changes a lot between the pan and the handle, which makes the handle cooler, which is a good thing. So let's now check your understanding. Let's suppose that we have a hot object and a cool object, and we connect them with two different objects, one and two. They're made of the same material, and object two has a larger cross-sectional area. And after a long time, which of these statements about fluxes, temperature differences, and thermal conductivities is true?